Module 8, Nonverbal Communication. Nonverbal communication refers to messages expressed by non-linguistic means. However, even though they're not words, some nonverbal messages do have a vocal element. These messages often convey more than the words being said. Think of an example where you read someone's nonverbal signal incorrectly. Then think of an example of a nonverbal behavior you had that you didn't even know about until someone else pointed it out. Imagine all the misunderstandings we have because of nonverbal behaviors that we misinterpret. Some of the characteristics of nonverbal communication are that all behavior has a communicative value. So that means that everything that you're doing while you're communicating is sending out some kind of message. It's impossible not to communicate. And even if we wanted to try to not pick up nonverbals, it's like we have a built-in transmitter that, that picks up and sends out. So this information is, is coming out, is going back and forth, but we're not always really conscious of what we're conveying or even what we're picking up. So for that reason, nonverbal behavior is not always interpreted accurately. There are some differences between verbal and nonverbal communication. Um, verbal communication in particular, is, in particular is mostly voluntary and conscious. We're pretty much aware of the words that we form and how we say them. But nonverbal communication is the op opposite. Most of the time, it's unconscious. Sometimes we're, we're very aware and we're um, intending to, to gesture or do something nonverbal. But really, a lot of the time, we're not aware at all. When you're verbally communicating, lots of times you're talking about content. But very often, nonverbally, you're sending relational messages. So that term that we used earlier in the course um, implies that you're indicating something about emotion or how you feel about the person or the situation. Um, very often nonverbal is quite ambiguous. It can be read very differently by different people. Uh, lots of um, the nonverbal behaviors and communication that we have is shaped by biology. They're tendencies that we have. And often you might uh, you will notice if you're meeting a member, a family member of someone that you know, you'll think, Wow, they, you know, they have some of the same gestures, some of the same tone or the way they speak. So bi biology sometimes um, is the, the base of our nonverbal behaviors. Um, also, nonverbal communication is continuous. So um, you can stop talking, but nonverbal is usually going on all the time. And it's multi-channeled. So it's not just words um, like verbal communication. It's also... Um, it's a variety of things, how you stand, how your voice sounds, the tone, um, the, the way that you're speaking. It's really quite um, a broad type of communication. Nonverbal communication is ambiguous, which means unclear, primarily relational, and influenced by culture. So think of all the potential for misunderstanding using nonverbal communication. What are some of the examples that you can think of of different interpretations for nonverbal signals in different cultures? We've probably all heard that the OK signal that we use with our, with our fingers doesn't mean the same in, in other countries as it does in ours. But maybe you can think of some other ones. I know I've also heard that people in some cultures consider crossing your arms a sign of disrespect, whereas for, for us, uh, really a lot of people kind of cross their arms when they're, when they're sitting or, or standing. Um, another one that I can think of is in some countries it's considered really rude to, to um, cross your legs because it, it points your feet at people and pointing your feet or the soles of your feet in the direction of a person is a, is a rude thing to do. So you might be able to think of some others, or certainly search, a search on the internet will give you lots of information about that. Um, there are reasons that we communicate 
um, non-verbally. And sometimes we, as, as uh, mentioned before, sometimes we do do it on purpose. So for example, complimenting and accenting. If I want someone to go to the right, I'll often gesture to the right. So that complements um, what, I've, what I've just said. It might be a repetition. So um, if, I, if I'm demonstrating something that I'm doing, I might act it out or indicate um, what I've said with my hands as a way for people to remember it. Um, sometimes it's a substitution. So rather than say, I don't know, I might just say, well, I've been thinking about what to do, and then I might shrug. So it's a substitution for some words. Sometimes it regulates what I'm saying, so it might um, amplify, so if uh, the tone of my voice might add strength to what I'm saying, or it might take it down, and very often it contradicts, so I might be saying something pleasant, some polite and pleasant words, but the tone of my voice and the way I'm looking sends a message um, to the person that I'm speaking to that I'm actually not that relaxed. So um, for those reasons, in your text you'll be reading about how um, very often nonverbal communication can either hide deceit, we use it to try to, to hide our meaning, um, but also sometimes we pick up on people's nonverbal communication as a way of detecting deceit. So are they really saying what they mean? There's lots of types of nonverbal communication. Your face and eyes give away a lot. Um, so the expressions that you have and even the patterns of eye contact. Also your body movement, so um, kinesics is the study of how people communicate through body um, movement. So the, the illustration here shows someone who's really trying to show, hey, I want to answer this question or I, I want to talk right now. Um, manipulators are, the, is the term used for a group of ambiguous gestures that are kind of um, fidgety. So that's a type of movement as well. I know if I'm getting um, bored with the meeting, if I'm sitting in a meeting and I'm losing concentration, I'll start to fidget around and that's a very clear signal to other people that, gee, you know, she's, she's checking out mentally. So it's something I have to watch for, for example. Um, touch. The amount that you touch people. If you touch people while you're talking, it can really um, add to your message or, or send a, a message. Um, to the person that you're touching, your voice, the way you speak, and also part of nonverbal communication are disfluencies. And it's funny when I'm narrating these presentations, I'm really aware of how often I say um or I hesitate. Um, um, so it's something that we do. It's a, a rather than sit here quietly, silent, silently, well, while I'm catching my um, there, there was one right there. Uh, my frame of mind or trying to, to come up with words to say, instead of having a silent space, a little um creeps in there. Proxemics is a study of how you use the space around you. Um, so your personal space is a term that's used for the comfort zone that you have uh, where you'll allow people in and you'll feel comfortable with it. Um, this differs for everyone. So usually intimate distance is skin contact or about 45 centimeters apart. That's not, that's pretty close. Um, personal distance can be from about half to a meter, so foot and a half to three, a little over three feet. Uh, so social distance comes after that. And in about, you know, 10 feet or so is where we like people we don't know to be. If you um, have ever been in a room where a person is having to move in closer to someone else in order to speak, in order to be heard, so a noisy kind of place like a party, um, for some people it's really uncomfortable to have other people come into that personal space, even if it's for a communication purpose. Territoriality is, is an element of nonverbal communication. So marking your space. And you might find that if you're in a classroom that someone likes to sit in the same place every day. And if they um, walked in one day and found someone there, it would feel odd to them because they, they have um, sent a message that says, this is my, my chair, just by having sat in it every class. Or sometimes they'll leave something behind and that says, don't sit here. Um, time. So chronemics, it's how we use and structure time. So that can send messages as well. Um, 
and earlier we talked to, in the language unit about different ways of interpreting the word late. All, we use time sometimes as a message and sometimes that's often not really um, not really something we plan to do. So I think the example I gave you was that if you always show up a few minutes after an assigned time, you might not be realizing that the nonverbal message you're sending is, I don't really respect you or I don't value being with you because I'm, I'm not making an effort to be here when we agreed to, to meet. So um, often not aware of the, the symbol or how we are um, sending out messages. Other types of nonverbal communication, physical attractiveness actually sends out a message. So we tend to warm up to people who are more attractive. We think they're more sensitive, strong, kind. All sorts of positive things go with just the way they look. Clothing is a tool of nonverbal communication. It can send messages about all sorts of things. And sometimes people will say, well, I just wear what I like to wear and I don't care what message it sends. It's okay if you don't care about it, but it doesn't change the fact that what you wear or how you look changes how people perceive you. Physical environment also sends messages. The way a classroom looks, whether it has windows, a color it's painted, all of those things can help you to focus or help you to be more comfortable in your environment or make you feel less comfortable. This is a really important area of nonverbal communication for us as people who will be designing or working in environments for children. So we'll finish off um, the presentation by looking at a couple of uh, photos what do you think of this space for children? This was taken in a center in Inuvik. Well, it looks pretty cozy, doesn't it? So the message that's being sent by this space is one of comfort, relax, feel, um, feel enclosed. It's almost like being cuddled by your space. Uh, this is also in a center in Inuvik, and this is a, a wall mural of the Northern Lights. And it sends a message about where we live, what our culture is. Um, uh, it helps connect the people in the room. We are people who live in the land uh, where Northern Lights are, right? Um, also, just the way it's organized and looks orderly sends a message, a message of routine, a message of comfort. The colors, the types of things you hang on the wall make a difference as well. So this um, shows some um, primary colors in the borders and some of the bright colors often used with children. But also you'll see some nice softer col colors that indicate um, nature, that are, that are more in tune with trying to have a realistic um, vision or, or depiction of what the world outside is like. This is from a center in Budapest in Hungary. And just the fact that there are so many natural materials sends a message, a message um, that I think also is very warm, very inviting. And if you walked into this space, I know you would want to explore and start making things with those materials. And lastly, also from a play yard in Hungary. This is a little bit hard to see, but what it is is it's in a backyard of a center and they've just used branches and twigs and intertwined uh, some wood slats with existing living trees to create a little space. So it's an outdoor playhouse. Um, but the way that it's left with a lot of openness to let the sunlight in, to let the, the trees and the leaves be part of the environment sends a message. It's a message of being out and connected with nature. So contrast that with the type of playhouse you might often see in a, in a daycare yard in Canada. It might be one made of a lot of bright colored plastics or bright colored wood. So something about this space um, sent a message that was different and it was when we're here we are in a human environment but we are still close to nature. So as uh, I close the presentation, I'll ask you to reflect on some of the spaces you've been in for children. Uh, what kind of messages do you think were being sent by the way they were designed, the colors used, the kinds of materials used in the environment?